Hey there. So my next guest has been an entrepreneur since he was five years old. He started a financial firm. He made a lot of money and then he's moved on and he's, he's got all kinds of other things going on. He talks about what it really takes to be an entrepreneur, what it takes to run companies. This was a really cool episode. I know you're all going to love it. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Gamerpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Carlton. Today, I have a very special guest with us. I have Al Paramito. Hey there, Al. How's it going? Hey, Brad. How are you? That's a beautiful sunny day in Las Vegas. How about yourself? We're up here in, uh, outside New York in Philadelphia, so it's a little bit uh, spring weather coming up, hopefully, right now. Oh, you know, hopefully, since you guys just had that giant ice storm. We did. Now it's like 50, so for us, that's pretty warm. You know, we're yep. hoping it's going to get a lot more in the future, though. I love it. All right, Al. So I like in the show to start right into it. I don't do have a lot of fluff. Uh, why don't you begin by just telling us a little bit about yourself, please? Well, my uh, my background is basically in uh, technology. You know, I'm a very passionate person and um, again, curious. I'm a very curious person in technology. I really follow uh, my, my passion and curiosity to figure out, you know, solutions to answers that I want to look into. But, um, you know, myself personally, it's, uh, you know, I'm from the developing marketplace, you know, out here in um, the East Coast. Yeah, you know, I um, had startup companies since I was 24 years old until now. So my first one was right out of college. Uh, it was a financial services company. Yeah, I scaled that from my sister's bedroom to, you know, had an office in three countries. So that was pretty fun. But as a person, yeah, I'm just really a um, person who likes to help people and, uh, you know, always in education, uh, technology, things like that. I love it. Okay. Now, Al, uh, we, before we started the show, I, we kind of discussed this question. I start every episode with a single question. So I'm going to yeah. ask you just like I ask everybody else <laughs> on a scale of <laughs> one to 10, 10 being high, how weird are you? How weird am I? Um, you know, what? it's probably a seven. Um, but yeah, we talk about this. You know, people think weird is a, is a bad word, but it's just being, you know, following what you love to do. And people may not look at that as, a, as what they think is, is cool. So yeah, I think a seven is pretty much where I fall in that uh, weird category. Fantastic. Now you had asked me to change it to geeky. So how geeky are you? <laughs> I'm really geeky. I mean, I, I really do like you know, technology. I do, like I said, I'm, I'm passionate about following my curiosity. So, you know, when there's something I don't know, um, and I was not always in technology. My first company was in financial services. So I had a learning curve to really get into that field that I want to know more about. So I am always learning, self-taught a lot of things. So, um, you know, geeking technology as far as like coding. I'm not a deep, deep coder, but I can get by. So, um, you know, I do like, uh, I'm a 10 geek probably on that area, but I will say, yeah, I'm not. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Now this is the gamer preneur podcast. Before we get into the, any of the entrepreneur stuff, I do need your gaming cred. When did you first start playing video games, Al? Oh, I was Atari. Back in uh, when they first started in Centipede, Donkey Kong, uh, Asteroids. So I go way back to when it first, first started. So I saw the progression of gaming from that point, very, uh, very basic to where it's at now, which is night and day, just unbelievable where it came from. Does it blow so your mind? Just, it does blow your mind because we had like we had Pong back in the day, these little squares and little pixels. That's it. Pac-Man, right? So these things are like cool when we were growing up. And then, you know, we never had the interaction with other P other gamers uh, through the consoles. We never had you had to invite your friend over, your father had to you know, hook up to their TV. So it was a really different, different experience. We did see the progression of how the technology was progressing between consoles at the time Nintendo came out with their stuff. So you could saw that there was something happening there. It wasn't a fad or a trend, but you know, as kids, you just didn't, you know, you just didn't see it. Your parents wanted you to go out and play baseball or football. And when we talk about kids and families, they still have the same impression, right? They still have the fact that, you know, why you're in front of that TV, the console instead of TV, right? Uh, why are you playing a video game? You know, you're not social, you're not active. So, you know, I go back to the understanding of where my parents were saying the same thing to me. And now I'm seeing it now with our generation saying it to their kids. So, you yeah, know, going way back to that point, it's a uh, it's great experience. Amazing where this industry is going. And, um, you know, to your credit, getting people to talk about it, it's really a, 
you're really amazing. It really is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, now, uh, are you still play video games? And if so, uh, what do you play? I like League of Legends is really a cool game for me. You know, I have kids. My my sons are uh, what twelve and fourteen, so they're in Rocket League and they're in uh, Apex and other things that you know they're playing on their side. You know, so that's what really got me back into gaming because my kids got to a point of their of age where they're they're gamers, right? And they're not kids that are athletes. So I had to adapt and try to communicate with them better, and that was really my um, yeah my my jumping off point with them. Okay. Now you've had the gamut. You've had access to every single game out there since, you know, way back when, Pong. If you had to pick one as your all-time favorite, which one would it be? You know what? Well, back, if I look at it now, it was, uh, it has to be Centipede, but I mean, that's like way back when. If I had to pick one now, it's it's League of Legends, but, you know, I just still like playing the game. It's still, it's still a fun game to play. <laughs> I love <Yeah>. it. <laughs> okay. Now that's, that's the extent of the gaming talk on my, my show. So let's get over to the preneur part. Could you uh, please, by giving just a little bit of your uh, professional background and how you got to where you're at today, please. So I was always a um, entrepreneurial kid, you know, as a, well, five years old, I was selling, you know, pretzels door to door um, in my neighborhood, you know, my father skipped me up in, on Sunday. We used to go into Philadelphia. There's a place called the uh, Federal's Pretzels. which was a big bakery. It was the only place in Philadelphia that you can make pretzels. So I used to buy twenty dollars worth of pretzels, and back then it was a, a big box. And I used to go door to door with my wagon, selling uh, pretzels at uh, five dollars. Uh, no, six for six for five dollars. So I had like a hundred pretzels at the time. So I was making a good profit on a Sunday. So that was one of my first jumping off point. But I always had those little, you know, those little gigs. Um, I was hustling as a young man. You know, I sold swatch watches in, in middle school, cookies. I could anything I get my hands on, I would sell. And but that was the, my progress of working uh, with my father because he was in the jewelry business. And then from that point on, um, I, when I got out of college, I opened up my financial services business. Um, I have Delaware, I have banking license. I scaled that mortgage company to a um, corporate financing business, uh, an asset management company to about $40 million. Uh, had offices in Canada, United States, Mexico. So we had a, a good a good run until you know, the recession hit and then all the financial services market uh, collapsed. So from that point on, you know, I had to really think about really what my next um, play was gonna be in the industry. And that's where, you know, you look at where you want to be your next, you know, your next passion, you know, health was always something I was um, intimately involved in because I'd like to work out a lot. Um, I was always curious about, you know, the industry itself. So that's what got me into medical technology and med tech. And that's really something that for me, it really follows, you know, hits on three of my, my, my points of interest which is really can it help people it will change your life and is there is a is there a big problem there uh, to solve and the answer is yes in all three of them so that's really what was my launching off point and i saw that in order to make um people healthy make people more interactive you know the hospital system had to be more, more managed outside the hospital and the only way to do that is through e-health and e-health basically that's digital healthcare, uh, remote healthcare, things of that nature, and, and writing applications and and integrating with a lot of different technologies. So, you know, from that perspective, that's how we got to uh, MedShifts, um, which is the company I'm, you know, at CEO now. Okay. So I, I love getting to talk to entrepreneurs because they they think totally different. They have usually different language. Um, so I, I, uh, we're gonna to have to bring this back for my audience though, because a lot of my audience is still kind of on that path of they're, they're starting out trying to figure this stuff out. What does a CEO do, especially at a, a med tech company like this? Well, it's really a leader who has a, a, a nice vision of the uh, where the company is going to be headed, and his his job is really to find the best people to fill those those gaps in his own personal. Um, uh, defaults really. I mean, personally, if you can't, you're not the in a CEO. You only have so many skill sets to to accomplish. And some are great salespeople, some are great engineers, some great operators. You know, our job is really to find the best people and teams to put together 
in order to make the um, the vision to be accomplished and break that down into chunks along the way to get that uh, those projects moving forward. Okay. And what makes a good CEO and you specifically, what makes you a good CEO? Really communication. I mean, and understanding your, your, the people in your organization, you know, empathy and compassion is definitely uh, something that you have to bring to the table with people. Um, you can't believe that people are going to work as hard as you work, especially if it's your business. So, you know, the old time when I was working in, um, I interned at Smith, um, Smith Barney was a kid. And I had this big broker I was working with, and for whatever reason, I didn't give him a note, and he just reamed me out in front of the entire co- entire company. I said to myself at that point, if I ever a company, I'll never ever treat anybody this this way. Yeah, in an organization, just um, you're all in it together. You're all a team player. You know, it's not an I, it's a we kind of thing. So in order to be a great CEO, you have to be a great communicator. You have to have know the skill sets of each employer you're involved with and place them in a in a, um, a position to win you know you're not gonna put someone who's not really good in sales in a sales position so you can't expect people to be something you want them to be so as a ceo you really have to be managing a lot of different things like that fantastic okay thank you for that al now did you help found this company I did. I found the company and then we, uh, I got some great executives along the way, some great salespeople. Yeah. Some good, great DevOps teams that we work with. So okay. yeah, it's a progression. Beautiful. Now, um, uh, I'm assuming that you did this a little different than like a startup startups, you know, the, the founders have to, they hustle, they grind, they figure out how to do it themselves. They maybe build the product themselves, start mm-hmm. selling it and then start stacking on the, the various people that they need in order to operate. Did you do yeah. it that way? Or did you kind of go a little bigger business? You had the business plan. Like what was the process for you? Yeah, for us, because again, because I didn't come from a, the knowledge of being in the medical industry, uh, I was sort of an outsider because usually if you're a doctor or some kind of medical uh, professional, either in pharma or in healthcare, you had the you know the pedigree to go out and say, well, let's raise money, look who I am, look who I got. I wasn't that person. I was somebody who didn't have any experience in the industry. So I really had to find my own traction first uh, find the right partners with some technology. I thought that was a really um, applicable in the current marketplace and open up those markets with them. So for me, it was really about um, proving concept in uh, an industry that I had no knowledge of and get some traction behind me before, you know, getting the whole uh, team together around it. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I really do try to make my show about advice for my my audience. Like, I want someone out there to see this episode, be inspired by you. Maybe they they've never thought they could ever own a business or have any idea of how to do it, and they go, "Wow, is it really that simple?" Or like, are those the steps I have to follow? So, I'd like to ask, how did you find those partners? Like you said, you had no no knowledge, no institutional knowledge on the subject mm-hmm. matter. Did you just start calling up doctors, or yeah, nobody does yeah. that anymore? Uh, yeah. Or like? Yeah. Like, how did how did you find these people in order to actually start this? You know, the thing, the thing you have to really find out is you first have to take an inventory of yourself. You have to really know what you're not good at and really write down that information. Because a lot of people tell you, to you, what are you good at? And there's a long list of stuff, right? If you're just not great, this, this, this. But they never take the time to say, what are you really not good at? And if you're really not good at something, that list could be a lot longer. So now you have to supplement what you're not good at with some people that you can hire or find in in the marketplace. And for me with any company, it really starts off small, right? You have to start with an old nucleus and find the people that can help you, you know, to, in the past, yeah, we call uh, people on the phone and, you know, find out where they're shifting their careers and bring them as partners or advisors. It could be your own circle of influence. You know, if you just look at your own family, um, friends, there's always somebody in there that has a, a certain knowledge of, of where you're trying to go. And you always ask those questions. I think sometimes um, a lot of people are afraid to ask questions or a lot of, they're afraid to ask for help. And because of my background, because I didn't have a, you know, a scholarly background, I had a lot of um, education issues going forward. I always asked for help. I always asked for uh, questions. So it was never, um, I never was afraid to do that. And I think a lot of times, a lot of people that are starting business are afraid to ask for help because it makes them think that they're inferior to, you know, to the person they're asking help from. But 
guys that are older that have been through it, we love giving advice. We love talking to younger generations and say, say listen, I screwed up so bad over here. Don't do that. Or you know, here's a path you can go with. Yeah, you know, I was just talking to another entrepreneur um, that's starting a, a female uh, company. And I said, listen, why don't you do a, a launch party for your friends that have a you know, baby shower, have a, you know, a business shower, right? Do something like that. It's fun. So everybody brings resources to the table. So I think you really got to you know, work within your network first, exhaust those resources. You know, you can go, you know, nowadays you can't go to business meetings to go to business events. Um, so that's out the window. LinkedIn's always a good resource if you can do that. But, um, you know, I think it's really just about networking and getting and not being afraid to get out there and talking to people. You know, shoot an email to somebody, you know, that's on LinkedIn. All right. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. I love that answer. And like my head is spinning. I'm, I'm trying to think of what else to ask. Um, how about this? Uh, let's get a little more personal about you. I, I know this is very, fairly personal this whole time, but you've been an entrepreneur pretty much your entire life. And yeah. some people, myself included, we kind of discovered that in ourselves. I mean, I had a lemonade stand when I was 10 and my yeah. parents kind of tamped me down like, oh no, you yeah. need to get a job and all that. Yeah. Um, what are some of the skills that an entrepreneur needs to have in order to be successful? You really need to have like you need to know a pathway of your vision. So we were, all of us have a very creative mind. Entrepreneurs are in general very creative individuals. So, but the problem is that you have to have an analytical mind as well as a creative mind because you have to really break down that vision to where you can get to the path forward. So you know the important thing is really just to um, the skill sets you'll find in entrepreneurs. You know somebody who is tenacious never gives up is they call it stubborn, which is you know a good way to put it, I guess. But they uh, they have a purpose. Really, most entrepreneurs have a purpose in life. They find a, a, a purpose that are passionate like and they follow it to the very end until they can't uh, they can't do it, you know, anymore. Or it doesn't make business sense. I love it. Now, Al, I would like you to hop in a time machine with me. All right. We're going right. to go back and we're going to go meet your five-year-old self back when he was selling pretzels. Okay. And you get yeah. to go up to him and you're going to be able to explain all of the ups and the downs, all the trials and challenges, all the good and the bad. You're going to be able to give him all the advice that you think he needs in order to make everything go bigger, faster, more profitable, just explode his entire life better than you ever wished you could have had it. But there was one thing he absolutely had to know. What is that thing? Have become more, more social. Get involved in developing your social network. You know, be, have friends that are older than you that know more than you. You know, keep in contact with people that've been in business. Um, if you have been connected with somebody, you know, I think that my challenges as a child was that I was so analytical and into a lot of the curiosity stuff that I didn't have a lot of. Uh, I was a very introverted child. So my, my extrovertedness only came when I was in business, which was a little bit too late. As a child, you really have to be an extrovert and wanting to be around older people who you know have adult conversation about business and learn from them. Um, so I would suggest that if you're young and you were starting off, get involved with, you know, and make a network of, of people that are older that know more than you. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Okay, the point you just made that you were an introvert and you became an extrovert. Is yeah. that is that really true? Are you still like an introvert at heart or or is that well, something that, like how's that go? Yeah, I can sit in front of a computer and, and do my work all day long and not worry about you know talking to somebody. But yeah, you know, it is challenging. I think when you're older now and you're you want to make sure people understand your vision, you have to be a good communicator. You know, that's a skill that you have to develop. And I did that because when I started my, my business at 24, um, you're always on the, on the phone talking to somebody about what you're doing, you know, who you are, where's your business, why is your business different than the other person's business, why should I do business with you? And so over time, you develop that skill. So, you know, you, you can start off as an introvert, which is basically just a, I can't call it immaturity, it's an emotional, um, it's an emotional immaturity that hasn't developed yet, right? But I think in when you get older, you know, you're not afraid too much to get out there. Now, can I get on a stage like some of these influences and talk to thousands of people? 
Probably not. I mean, I can really, I really have to work towards that goal. But you know, talking about to you or talking to somebody that's out there about what I'm doing and where my vision is at, absolutely, uh, because it's passion to me. It's been my purpose. It's what I want to do. So I think you can develop that skill. You don't have to be classified as an introvert, uh, or nobody can classify you as an introvert. I think what some people will do in our culture is that they start pointing the finger that you're introverted, you're lazy, you're this, you're that. And then what happens is children believe that because it's coming from an adult that they, ha they have to admire. So, you know, only the ones that have sort of um, um, understanding of who they are, you know, push through that. Yeah. Okay. So. Beautiful. All right. Now, Alex, this one's going to be a little more personal than any of the others I've asked. So, um, I believe we learn the most in our life from our failures, not necessarily our successes, because when you succeed, like the first time, you may not realize what happened. You just kind of roll with it. Right. But when you fail, you got to take a look at it. You'll be able to figure out what happened, move past it in order to succeed the next time. Now, when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, when I say failure, they're like, Oh, you only fail when you quit. So I'm going to ask you a little bit different than I would normally ask my guests. Um, what do you believe was the most impactful learning experience that you had in your life? And what did you learn from it? You know, when the, when the company um, closed down, um, there was two things, the reason why I closed. It was closed because of the economic issue that we had. And also it was the management that I put in place in certain key um, markets like Canada. And they were good producers of, of revenue and they did really well that, but they, they didn't, they were, their characteristics weren't in line with my own. So I guess what the biggest problem I had is that sometimes when you put people in place, they become a cancer in the organization rather than a benefit because of their production. And you overlook their production, the, the people who they are as a character because they produce a lot. And I think that's a wrong way of, of looking at the value of a, of, a, of a company or an employee is that you don't value them by what they produce about their character and who they are. And I think sometimes leaders um, get caught up in making the quarter or making the revenue goals and the sales goals, and that's what drives them. And that's not that's not really what should be the driver of an organization. It really is the um, the character and the uh, and the vision going forward and taking care of the people you're you know involved with. Okay, so I think that was why one of the biggest biggest you know obstacles and failures there. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, kind of on the flip side, what is something that you're working to improve on yourself today? I'm always working on myself. I mean, I'm a, I'm a work in progress uh, from, from day one. I, there's nothing about me I, I, that is finished. I mean, I have to constantly read. Um, I do like reading. I have challenges reading, um, but I do read. Um, I want to read more. You know, I want to network more with my friends, be you know, closer to my family. You know, um, you know, position my position what I'm doing now for the future. So, you know, there's always a work in progress with me. Yeah. At least my wife tells me that. So <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more fun question before we bring this in for a landing, Al. Um, yeah. What is something that you think people misunderstand about you the first time they meet you? Well, I'm a really intensive person. Like I'm serious. I'm pretty serious and intense when it comes to topics I really have passion about. And I, I mean, maybe because I'm older, I don't, um, I cut through all the BS and I'm not a good, um, I, I don't really have the, the skill set to uh, sit in an audience or a room and talk about really mundane or frivolous things. Um, and that may, I may come across as being an asshole a lot of times or being really bad. Um, but just because I have, little time and uh, my interest is lies on the intellectual side a lot of times and what the sports is doing today uh, game so i think i'm, I'm misconstrued that way yeah right. but i'm a really good guy just i have a, a t intense personality sometimes wonderful all right al this has been a fantastic interview how do people find you how do they reach out where are you on social media contact information all that please you know, if you'll reach out to me directly it's great you can call me at gamer at esportstowns.com uh that's uh my my esports town company so reach out to me there directly you'll get me um you know i, I would say go through my handles but you can go through and email me directly i'll, I'll respond to you as well Okay, beautiful. Now, as we wrap this up, do you have any final thoughts you want to share or anything I didn't ask you think we still need to cover? No, I think you did a great job of the interview. I mean, this is, I think with, when you talk to entrepreneurs, you really have to, especially in this market right now, just I, well, you want to tell them that they really have to look for the white space in, 
in, in market fluctuations because every great company that's been ever developed was developed during a pandemic or during a real dramatic shift in the economy. So if, he, if the kids are looking at the market or entrepreneurs look at the market today and they're saying, well, we can't do this because you know it's just an economic disaster. If you've been through economic disasters like the Great Recession and now the pandemic, you'll find in that 10 year time period, there's been a lot of opportunity that has arised. So your job as an entrepreneur is really to find those cracks. And then when you find that crack, just fill it with yourself and then expand it into a grand canyon in the next 10 years and you'll really achieve a lot. So just don't be afraid, just get out there and, and drive home the, uh, your vision. You definitely live somewhere where it's cold. You got the ice metaphor going. <laughs> I, I have to, man. It's right. All right. Al, All right. thank you so much for coming on with us today. I genuinely do appreciate it. Ah, Brad, it was great talking to you. All right. And for everybody else, I'm going to remind you all, don't be just a gamer, be a gamerpreneur. Yeah, absolutely. 